Well, hello everyone, and you know, after this wonderful uh, sushi lunch, I cannot resist but talk about salmon. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I think it's a really contested political issue. You know what, I took this photo yesterday at the Bergen fish market, because that's the first place I wanted to go to upon arriving. So the second thing, I went up the hill, um, but then, you know, first the fish market. And I posted this online and on my Russian page on Facebook. And immediately it got something like a hundred likes. Because it is so political. I'm saying, okay, here are the forbidden fruit, you know, forbidden fruits of Dimare. Uh, because uh, all of this uh, political scandal that uh, were uh, in the beginning, uh, that uh, the, one of the uh, sponsors of the event was talking about, uh, about uh, this whole food sanctions in Russia. It's really a very contested issue, uh, which is precisely about the nature of borders. And I chose salmon as maybe a very borderless thing, because salmon is a wonderful border crosser. You know, the fish that lives between uh, the river and the sea, and then at one, some, at one point feels this mystic urge to go to the place of its origin and, you know, finds its way through the seas and, you know, goes, to this, uh, goes eventually to the spot, the only spot in the world where it can make caviar. So, uh, salmon is a wonderful border crosser. And it's interesting that in the year 2014, having enjoyed uh, some 20 years of relative prosperity in Russia, having used, you know, to Norwegian salmon, sushi delivery in 10-15 minutes to your home, suddenly we're going back to the world of sanctions and embargoes and we have to impose upon ourselves this, you know, rather ridiculous sanctions against Norwegian salmon, Spanish jamon, uh, uh, Italian parmigiano, French brie, and so on. So there is something to this, this kind of debordering, the borders that Russia imposes upon herself this year, 2014. And I wanted to talk about this, but I want to start with the Berlin Wall. And accidentally, in a few weeks, uh, in early November, we'll be celebrating 25 years, a quarter century since the fall of the Berlin Wall. And it's a whole generation, really. And uh, you know what? I spent this 25 years very much contributing to the uh, political science discourse of what we call the post-wall Europe. I once made a sort of a rough calculation and of the political scientists, the political science and contemporary history articles written in this period, about 70 or so percent were beginning with the words after the fall of the Berlin Wall. We were living in the world post-Berlin Wall and we thought it's a brave new world of the end of history as Francis Fukuyama had taught us, but also the world of the end of geography as a geographer, George Omai, once said. Because uh, we saw that it's a liquid modernity. Zygmunt Bauman, a famous uh, Polish-British sociologist, was speaking about liquid modernity. That modernity became totally liquid, that you know, flows were crossing borders, and uh, that there was no stop to the human flows. And indeed, uh, a new theory has emerged, uh, the space of flows. It said that we no longer live in the space of places. Space of uh, place is a physically demarcated space. But to live in a social space of flows, you know, one flow is, uh, you know, the internet, the Facebook, you know, the TED conference is a flow, uh, human migration is a flow, like disease, Ebola is a, is a flow, so, so on. So uh, this was a world of uh, what we political scientists call the world of deterritorialization, debordering, the post-industrial, the brave new post-industrial world of late modernity, in which space, physical space, no longer mattered, in which we lived in a virtual space. And uh, it is in this space, however, that absolutely new challenges have emerged. After 12 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, we had 9-11. So this was also the brave new world, but not only the world of democracy and information society, the information superhighway, as Bill Clinton would uh, have us believe, but also the world of terrorism, the world of rampant organized crime. The world where, as we learned from Al-Qaeda and now from the Islamic State, where uh, radical ideologies, religious fundamentalism springs up. A world of separatism, looking at uh, these days referenda in uh, Scotland, in Catalonia, but also the guise of separatism that is, you know, Russia-inspired separatism in East Ukraine, in Crimea and East Ukraine. I mean, some of, they're very different, of course, right? Uh, one, one, in one case, we have a grassroots separatism. In another case, we have, uh, you know, separatism which is promoted from the neighboring country. But still, it is the world in which suddenly the idea of identity, of local identity, of re-territorializing your identity, of thinking your own land, becomes more important than it was 10 or 20 years ago. 
It is also uh, a period in which illegal migration and drug trafficking have become so important, and therefore uh, the importance of borders has grown in order to stop, to stop this migration. And this is also a period of uh, income gaps growing among nations. It's not, not only among nations, but within each nation. We haven't really progressed into a more happy world of equity, of you know, some global Tobin tax imposed by the uh, you know, global community on the richer nations of the global financial transactions to help the poor. Indeed, 25 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, we live in a world much more divided by uh, income, by prosperity, by security. So therefore, we are suddenly witnessing a, wor a world of much higher walls among nations, but also within nations. There are more gated communities. If you look at the you know, many nations, we have more and more closed gated communities. So uh, really, uh, in the sense of we live in a world uh, which has really become what the German sociologist Ludwig Beck had called the risk society. The sense of risk, the sense of unpredictability is much, much higher these days. And in response to this, we see many new walls emerging. So paradoxically, 25 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, we are back to the world of walls. Let me show you some of the walls. Well, this is probably the most notorious, U.S.-Mexico. 570 kilometers long, the fence, you see here the U.S. border guard guarding it. Sometimes it's a flexible uh, fence, it's put on the dunes, on the drifting dunes. So you've seen, you know, this amazing pictures of, you know, Mexicans crossing it eventually still, you know, some people get stuck in the fence and so on. Morocco, West Sahara. This is 2,800 kilometers. Well, that had started earlier, before the Berlin Wall, in the 1980s, because this is a contested territory, and especially as Morocco claims the territory uh, is its own uh, sovereignty, therefore it pushes the wall. But indeed, it's, uh, it's an amazing construction, like the Great Wall of China it's seen from space. It's called the Berm. And this is, you know, thousands of thousands of kilometers of uh, fortified, uh, of uh, fortifications in the middle of the desert. Here you see that the moment is it was opened for the Paris-Dakar race. But as you know, since then uh, it's no longer safe for Paris-Dakar to be uh, to be going in this area. So it has switched to Latin America instead. So you see once again how the wall is becoming more concrete, more physical, preventing uh, the movement of people, uh, the movement of various uh, security concerns. Israel West Bank, 520 kilometers. Accidentally, there is you know, a famous phrase here written from uh, the famous Kennedy speech in Berlin, Ich bin ein Berliner. And you know, my German friend says there's always the translator made this um, funny slip there because for practical, uh, like uh, the true German would be Ich bin Berliner. Ich bin ein Berliner, it says, you know, I'm, this, uh, ein Berliner is you know, the Berlin, uh, the, the bun, right, which you have in the morning for coffee, ein Berliner. So indeed, what he says, you know, okay. I am a Berlin bun, but uh, okay, we know it, uh, this, uh, the whole political statement, and uh, it has to be written uh, over, it had to be written of the Israel West Bank, uh, which prevents uh, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians from moving to their, you know, work, from moving to their neighbors, which are behind the wall, and so on. So this is yet another symbol of the new post-post-wall world. So we got rid of the Berlin Wall, but we're in the world of new walls. India, Bangladesh arguably the longest wall in the world these days, uh, 4,100 kilometers. Indeed, India, what India did is surrounded Bangladesh by the fence. So uh, India is in the sense they're really a nation very obsessed with sovereignty. I've seen it myself. I'm, um, you know, sort of a border student. I was uh, at some point a member of the International Border Association of Border uh, uh, Academics. And uh, we once made a trip to Punjab, uh, University in Punjab, and I went to the famous border crossing uh, between India and Pakistan, where you know there's a so you can look at online, you can look at it online, the famous border ballet between the Indian and the Pakistani guards. So it has cheering crowds on both sides. The way how the uh, uh, border patrol, how the border policemen perform the flag uh, downing uh, ceremony each time at sunset, and they're like tens of thousands of people. It's like a football match. Thousands of people on each side, the way they march, the way, you know, they blow their horns. And at some point they come to physical contact, they're literally like inches between them uh, over the borderline. And then, you know, the sun goes down and it repeats every time. So India is very concerned about this border and about its sovereignty. So what it did, it constructed this fence. And it really became famous a couple of years ago when a girl died 
on this fence. Uh, there was a girl from Bangladesh, and uh, she was 16 years of age. She was going to marry. I didn't put the, the like very physical images of her, and she was just on the eve of her marriage, wearing her marriage dress. She crossed the wall with her relatives, uh, this you know barbed wire, uh, and she got stuck, got stuck in the barbed wire, and she was shot by an Indian policeman. So, and then her body was hanging there for days in her best wedding dress uh, because nobody could approach the wall eventually it was removed by the indian police and you know uh the policeman eventually you know that was big it, it got the international coverage but then eventually the policeman was found not guilty but her body and this whole wall became a symbol of a uh, divided nation you know india and uh, what was it called in east pakistan uh what became bangladesh and it really reminded to the concreteness of this wall and the human cost that it entails because of course the berlin wall cost the lives of 300 east germans that you know tried to cross into west germany but here too we have the daily loss of life of people trying to cross the borders and let alone you know let's remember you know this year was you know the richest harvest of dead people in the mediterranean Right? of how many people died trying to cross into, into Italy, into Greece, on the small boats, with all the wars in Libya and Syria going on. Uh, tens of thousands of people trying to cross on this illegal, this invisible border, which is in the Mediterranean Sea. People are daily losing their lives to the wolves. Here, too, people are losing their lives over this yet non-existing border, but they're going to construct it. There are 2,000 kilometers of unmarked border between Russia and Ukraine. Here is a typical view of this border. This uh, here, it, that is just where the border is. It's only demarcated by this uh, branches, by this dead branches. And uh, it's really uh, paradoxical that in 19, uh, that in 2014, in the 21st century, millions of dollars will be invested into this. You know, I was just had a brief conversation with a colleague before the start of the session, and he is dealing with starts up with startups in Russia and he goes, well, what do you think, you know, we should better invest what are the good startups? And I think, you know, a good investment is becoming a subcontractor for the Russia Ukraine wall. So uh, that's possibly the most the funniest, so to say, startup in uh, recent history. So uh, summing up, I did some brief calculation and found an interesting fact that border walls built during the Cold War, 1914-1990, 11. After the Cold War, 27 border walls, and they are much bigger in length. Some are really short. For instance, you know there is a you know wall around the Syrian city of Homs, uh, which is not a very contested one. But uh, some are long, as you have seen from uh, in the Bangladesh. Another interesting fact: average per capita GDP of nations inside the walls, constructing the walls, fourteen thousand dollars. Those outside, two point eight thousand dollars. So it's the rich building the walls against the poor trying to seal themselves from migration, from drug trafficking, from organized crime, or in some cases claiming their territorial possessions, like, uh, like Western Sahara, tries, uh, like um, Morocco tries to do in Western Sahara. Interestingly enough, it is used by democracies and autocracies alike, by Morocco and by the United States, by the super democratic India and uh, by, uh, by Syria and by uh, might the authoritarian Turkey. So uh, really the phenomenon is all encompassing, is overwhelming, and it really sends an important message for domestic audiences because since 9-11 there is an increasing <coughs> demand for security from domestic audiences. And therefore uh, building the walls really gives you a false sense of safety, a false sense of security that okay, we have gated our community, let's build a new wall. It's not a major investment, but you know, it's good for domestic audiences. So we see this, all of this uh, happening. And indeed, what is emerging, I would say, uh, is a, a new neo-archaic policy. It's really amazing how the world history has made a full circle in these 25 years. And uh, once again, I remember myself as a, you know, aspiring political scientist, a PhD candidate in the early 1990s, traveling, you know, Columbia University, and then working in Germany, working in Italy, you know, writing all these papers, how, you know, what a wonderful new world we're moving into, and uh, 
citing uh, the Russian democratization, which was going, of course, very painfully, but we had an electoral democracy of sorts, and then the normalization of the country, and, you know, looking at the European Union, uh, the Maastricht Treaty in 1993, then, you know, the Lisbon Treaty, and uh, so on, looking at the walls falling down, looking, you know, on the Schengen space emerging, looking at, you know, the visa restrictions lifted for the Russians and for, you know, tens of millions of people getting their foreign travel passports. So I really contributed a lot to this, uh, I know, postmodern discourse of debordering, de-walling, deterritorialization. And really, in these 25 years, I have seen this come a full circle and uh, the meaning of territory, the meaning of identity, the, so to say, concreteness of borders re-emerging. And uh, what I see today is really a world of re-territorialization, a world of re-bordering, and also, as new borders emerge, there's a fragmentation of global space. There is more fundamentalism, there is more parochialism, and in some cases there is more fascism. So we see this with the Islamic State. We see this, for instance, in the recent results of the EU elections, uh, in which uh, the right-wing and the secessionist parties uh, and anti-EU parties have done so well, remarkably well, uh, claiming, well, they cannot make a whole faction, but still it's about 15% of the European vote and, you know, in France. Uh, very like big chances of Marine Le Pen uh, claiming the next uh, presidential elections. Well, you know the story quite well. I think in Norway it's also quite quite big here and quite a concern. Uh, the uh, arch right, uh, the neoconservative, and sometimes the uh, neo-fascist movement. Well, I didn't have to tell you twice. Was the Breivik accident. Uh, and also separatism, which I already cited, uh, with Scotland, Catalonia, and all over the place. You know, next stop everywhere. And against this background, we also have an amazing wave of demodernization which occurred in my home nation, especially in the past six months. I can't believe the trajectory, the spiraling trajectory which Russia has taken in the past six months. It's only, what is it, seven months ago that Vladimir Putin was standing at the stands of the Sochi Olympics, at the closing of the Sochi Olympics, you know, hailed by the world, having, you know, managed the uh, Winter Olympics and the Subtropics, having won in the, you know, final uh, day of the, the Olympics. Uh, uh, so Russia, it was Russia's moment of glory. It was still okay, it was an authoritarian nation, but it was an accepted member of the national community. There was the G8, the G20, the WTO, the whole array of treaties and intricate links that we have, uh, you know, these webs that we have entered in the past 25 years. And then suddenly all this had to change was the annexation of Crimea. And Russia is now in a free fall. Russia is now a loose cannon. An absolutely unpredictable nation now led by the unpredictable leader. So this case of rapid demodernization, archaization of Russia is just amazing. And uh, so here comes this uh, story of, the, of this new wall with these food sanctions. Uh, with the Spanish jamón, uh, with the Norwegian uh, Settlement and so on. So in this uh, array of uh, self-imposed sanctions, as we see in Russia, like shooting itself in the food, what Russia does is really quite uh, quite amazing because many of the sanctions are really more punishing the Russian population than punishing the West. Like in this adoption ban, right? Let's let's not let our kids be adopted by foreign families. Okay, so kids are dying in Russian orphanages without the prospective American parents. So in the same case, of course, there's no import substitution. However, let me give you in the end one positive message. One positive message. As uh, uh, one of the uh, sponsors of the events, uh, you know, this um, uh, fish company was speaking in the beginning, they have found ways to substitute for the Russian market by supplying Chile and so on. And here is yet another very funny substitution. And uh, uh, Russian, uh, the Russian students that are here in the audience would understand. Uh, this was a photograph taken from the Russian supermarket, and it uh, says uh, Salmon and pieces, place of origin Belarus, Belarus. So we are flooded with Belarusian salmon, which, as you know, you might imagine that Belarus does not have an access to the sea. It's not a sea nation. So suddenly we have Belarusian oysters, we have Belarusian salmon, we have Belarusian mussels, we have Belarusian cods. And uh, it's all over uh, the internet, so that eventually we had this uh, uh, photograph, a sort of a design, uh, <coughs> on a design saying the Great Sea of Minsk. Uh, and uh, with, you know, shrimps. Uh, actually, yeah, it also says, you know, the American aircraft carriers here uh, of Jean Psaki, because she is quite an anti-hero for the Russian patriotic press, uh, the US uh, spokesman for uh, the State Department, and these are the aircraft carriers, but otherwise there's cod, and there's shrimp, and there's mussels, and there's salmon, 
and so on. So it gives us still an idea that the world of flows is still more powerful than the world of places. That you know the flows of global supply chains are still overpowering uh, this customs uh, barriers, uh, this uh, stupid sanctions barriers that Russia has imposed upon itself. But anyway, uh, summing it all up, 25 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, we are still fighting with the concreteness of these walls, and uh, I think it's our duty and uh, intellectual duty to try to deconstruct these walls and to see that we are still a big global place. And I think this event and all of us gathering here is a good contribution, is a great contribution to doing this. So thank you very much for your attention.